hustle brings bad news, men. The defense of the Alamo rests on us alone. Now, I won't minimize the gravity of our situation. General Santa Ana has nearly 5,000 men massed against us. Now, I can't force you beyond patriotism and your own conscience. While it's still dark, there's time to slip off to safety. I won't blame any man who doesn't stay. Those who stay, cross over the line. Boys, I don't think I can make it myself. I sure would appreciate it if somebody had to help me across. Thank you, man. Line in the sand moments. We've all had them. Decisions and moments that change the direction of our lives. You could probably think about uh, a lot of those instances you've dealt with. Maybe it was in a relationship. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you had to decide whether you were going to continue in a relationship with a guy or a gal. Maybe it was in a job. Maybe it's the direction you're going to go, but every one of us had those moments where we had to make a decision about the direction of our lives. And that's really what we come down to in John chapter 6. We have been looking at John 6 and Jesus teaching about being the bread of life and ha in the last several weeks. And now we come down to that pivotal moment uh, that people are faced with the reality of what they're going to do with that. And in verse 60... Uh, John shares it like this, or reports it like this. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? That, that teaching was, if you, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And, and that's a hard statement. That, he's not saying it's difficult to understand. He's not saying it, it's hard to wrap my mind around. It's just a hard one to swallow. Uh, who in their right mind would would say such a thing? Who in the right mind would, would take such a step? Uh, I would imagine all of us have had friends tell us stories or say something to us that we have stepped back and said, yeah, I'm not sure I can buy that. It's a little bit hard to accept uh, that that's the way it is. That's where Jesus has brought this crowd to. They, he, they've taken him literally. They have, have uh, said this is what you know, in our minds, he's wanting us to be cannibals, but Jesus is talking more about faith and belief and trust in him for the provision of man's salvation. This is one of those watershed moments. A friend of mine in Cottage Grove, who I had the privilege of baptizing, uh, he and I fished together a little bit, and we always talked about the decision. We have to decide whether we're going to cut bait or fish. You know, and that's, that's really this moment that these people have come to in regards to Jesus. They have followed him everywhere. They have been with him and heard his teaching, saw his miracles, and now he's, he's preached this, and they have to decide what they're going to do with it. Let's pick up verse 61 as we continue to read. It says, aware of this, his disciples were grumbling about this, aware, aware of these disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. 
Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Let's pray together. Father our God, I thank you for today. I thank you for Jesus who uh, challenges us to the very core of our being. I thank you that his teaching uh, bring us to the point where we must decide whether or not we are going to follow or whether we're going to walk away. Uh, Lord, today I ask that you would help us to listen to the message, listen to your spirit as he talks about not about anybody else, but about us and, and our response to what Jesus has said. Uh, Lord, uh, let your word be powerful today. Spirit, be our teacher. Help us to understand who we are and what response we need to make now. In Jesus' name, amen. There are three responses in, in the story, and, I, and that's what we want to look at today. I want to begin with the first one, and that I call a response of defection. Uh, verse 66 says, From this time, get my glasses on, from this time many of his disciples turned back. And no longer followed him. That these people have been following him everywhere. From this time, from this moment, from from this teaching about the body and the blood. That is the deciding factor. And they turn around and go the other way. It's it, it's they have been on. If we've used the word bandwagon, they have been on Jesus' bandwagon for for months. They have followed him. They've been excited about him. But now they come to that place and realize. This wagon is going the wrong direction. Uh, this has taken me somewhere I don't want to go. Uh, Dolores and I went to uh, New York a few years ago, and we had tickets to a Yankee game. My whole reason to go to New York. Uh, and uh, so that day, we got, we got up, and uh, excitement filled the day. We went down and got on the subway to head to Yankee Stadium. And we rode along, and, and I looked out the window, and something didn't seem right. But I'd never been to New York before, so I just... We stayed on the train, and as Dolores said, told somebody earlier, we, it was only supposed to take a certain amount of time, and the time just kept reeling off, and we're going, ah, something's not quite right. So we got, but we didn't know we were on the wrong train until we arrived at Coney Island. Uh, so at Coney Island, we got off the train, got on the one, and went back to the right direction. That's, if we had realized sooner, we would have gotten off and, and taken the other train. That's what this is. The, these people have thought Jesus is taking them to a specific place. He is going to be a king. He's going to establish an earthly rule. He's going, to, he's going to do great things for us. Now suddenly they realize what we thought isn't actually true. And so they, they get off the train. And Jesus explains why back in verse 61 when, when he asks them the question, does this offend you? The word offend actually means scandalized. It, it, it's, it's the word the Greeks used for a stumbling block. It's that root or stone you trip over when you're out hiking or the thing you fall over in the living room as you're trying to get through the house at night. The, the statements of Jesus were a scandal. They made people step back. It's scandalous. You open your eyes and open your mouth and say, no, that can't be. And when it's so scandalous, they decide, yeah, we just can't, we just can't go there. They were offended, and and it's interesting if you think about that. That, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The fact that Jesus tends to offend people. William Barclay said there's two reasons why people are offended by Jesus. Number one is his demand for absolute surrender. He says. Let, you, let every man deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is not something we do part-time. This is not something that just gives part of myself to. It, Jesus asks for every bit of my life. Somebody after service says, what does, that, what does take up your cross mean? And I, and I said, it's whatever. I think it's whatever Jesus brings into our lives. I'm committed to doing all that he says. But a second reason people become offended is his strict moral code of conduct. 
Uh, if you go to Matthew 5, you see him realigning that a little bit. He, and you'll find those phrases. It says, you've heard that it's said. And he talks about, you've heard it said, you shall not kill, murder your brother. And he says, I tell you, if you hate your brother, you are already guilty of murder. That thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you think about a woman in an unworthy manner, you have already. Jesus didn't broaden the scope. He narrowed it and made the path narrow. And there are some people who say, no, it's just too strict. And uh, chances are in recent months and weeks and maybe even years, you have noticed how offensive Jesus' standard of morals are in our society. Uh, if you stand for Jesus, you become a, a racist, you become a, a, a radical, you become some kind of weird uh, person out there that, that just doesn't compute. And so people are offended by that. And when they get offended, they will turn and walk away. But notice Jesus' response. Uh, uh, Jeffrey and Selmy said this is probably the least effective sermon, unsuccessful sermon ever preached. We define successful sermon by everybody coming to the front. Jesus preached this sermon and everybody went to the back. Uh, the word, the pulpit commentary said the word actually means everybody. It's not one person saying, well, I'm out of here. It's everybody. It became a rush. It became almost a stampede. Nobody could get out of the synagogue fast enough. And Jesus let them go. Imagine what would happen. Imagine what happens when one person decides to leave a church because of something. We go almost into panic mode. What can we do to bring them back? Notice what Jesus did. He let them go. He didn't, he didn't panic. He didn't change his message. He didn't plead with them to stay uh, for the sake of numbers. His message was his message. His truth was was the truth. And Jesus would not and could not change that truth just for the sake of maintaining followers. That, that says a lot to us today, doesn't it? I think there's several things, lessons that we can, we can grab and take away from that. No, number one, let's understand, people are going to be offended by the message we preach. 1 Corinthians 2.23, Paul said we preach the cross, Christ crucified, Foolishness to the Greek and a stumbling block to the Jew. Scandalous. People are going to be offended. God's word, number two, will attest people and attract people. There, how do you explain the fact that when the cross is preached, there is, are people who will come to the cross and preach that same message and there will people go the other way? It tests the hearts of men. It reveals who we are and where we are in relationship with God. The next thing is people leaving can be painful and healthy. I, I don't think any of us can sit there and in our mind's eye and have Jesus watching that crowd leaving the synagogue and not see his heart breaking. Not seeing maybe tears well up in his eyes and, and understand that it's painful. And it hurts. I, how many people enjoy rejection? I, I've never met anybody who says, I, I just, I love it when people reject me. Think back to when that uh, guy or girl broke up with you. Walking wet, there was pain. That's what these people were doing. They have been with Jesus for all these months and suddenly they say, we don't, we don't love you anymore. And they turn and walk away. It can be painful, and it hurts when people walk away from the church. It hurts when people walk away from the faith. But it also can be healthy. It's pruning season. I'm sure you've seen driving down the roads at orchards of people cutting limbs and trimming trees down and making them look kind of ugly. And, and maybe we look at that and say, boy, that, that just seems harsh. But the reality is that pruning process is healthy. They take out the limbs that are damaged and diseased that are going to affect the tree. They take out the, the branches that aren't going to bear fruit so they can bear fruit. They open up the tree so air can flow through it. 
And while it looks painful, looks harsh, and looks, looks like it's not necessary, it is actually healthy. And folks, we need to understand that when there are times when, it's, when people leave the church, that it is a good thing for the health of the congregation. It's hard. And some of you are probably thinking, well, I don't agree with that. But then you look at John 15, and Jesus says, God is the gardener. He trims and he prunes to make the vine more fruitful. There are some who just take life from that vine and never produce anything. So people leaving can be painful, but it's also healthy. So some left. Some turned and walked away, but there are, then we have those who were determined. Look at verses 67 and 68. You do not want to leave two, do you, Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Can you picture that? Can you picture Jesus watching all those people leave? And he turns and he sees the 12 disciples. Maybe, somebody said maybe he's seen them kind of squirming in their seats a little bit as he preached. Maybe they're looking at each other like, you know, what do we do? And so he asks the question, you don't want to leave too, do you? Now, first off, let, let me point out, this question is asked in such a way to get a negative response. He's asking for them to affirm their commitment. He's giving them an opportunity to say, we're with you. And maybe he asked the question simply because at the human part of him needed some reassurance. Maybe the man that Jesus was was hurting and he needed to know somebody was going to stand with him. So he gives them the opportunity to affirm their commitment. You don't want to leave too, do you? And as we look at the story, guess who speaks up? You'd never guess. Peter. Peter's always the one. And if you read the story, there is no indication that Peter asked anybody else how they felt. But maybe it was because they've had a lot of conversations about this. Maybe they have talked about who Jesus is and talked about what he's doing. But Jesus steps up and said, where would we go? You know, you have, you have offered us something we can find nowhere else. You know, why would I go to Burger King when McDonald's is so good? They offer something nobody else offers. Maybe we ought to be thankful for that. Peter says, we're here. We're not going anywhere. Because you offer us what we can't find anywhere else, and you are the Holy One of God. Now, let, having said that, let me assure you, these guys really didn't understand the full import of what they were saying. Uh, you know, uh, you remember Peter on, uh, on the night that Jesus talked about, well, he made his good confession, and Jesus said, I'm going to die, and Peter said, not if I have anything to do with it. You know, I, I, I'm with you, I'll die with you. They failed, didn't they? They failed in their determination. Go to the garden. Jesus is praying, the soldiers show up, and they arrest Jesus, and what happens to the disciples? Nine of them hit the wind. They are gone. Two of them follow to the high priest's house. One of them goes in the house of the high priest and watches the proceedings. Peter stays out in the courtyard, and what does Peter do before the night's out? Denies Jesus three times. Only one of them stayed with him through the whole ordeal, John. So let's understand that when Jesus made this, or when these guys made this commitment, it didn't mean they were going to do it perfectly. And for us, when we make that determination for Jesus, let's not expect us to do it perfectly. I've failed. I have failed to stand up for Jesus in my life, even though I love him with all my heart. The interesting thing about all these decisions is none of them are terminal. None of them are permanent. 
when I fail, if I walk away, I have the opportunity to come back. If I fail in my determination, I have the opportunity to find forgiveness and grace. And as a third one, it's not terminal. None of these are final until we draw our last breath. But the disciples say, where will we go? You have the words. Look at the, to whom shall we go? What, what other faith, what other religion in this world offers us what Christianity offers? What Jesus offers? If you examine them, there is only one religion in the world that has somebody who came and died for you. There's only one religion that has who that man was buried and he rose again on the third day. There's only one that offers you forgiveness through grace and the blood of Jesus. There is only one that offers you the assurance of heaven through faith in him. All the others require human effort and a lot of wishful thinking. Jesus offers what no one else offers. And the apostles knew that. You have words of eternal life. And we believe and know. That. Now, they believed and knew, but they didn't know it all yet. There are going to be moments in the days ahead when they're going to look at Jesus and say, oh, we don't get it. We don't understand. But they would. Peter said, we are committed. Whatever happens, wherever this train takes us, we're staying. Now, they didn't quite know that, but they would. If you look at the history of the apostles, every one of them, except one, died a violent death because of their commitment to Jesus. Every one of them were brought to that place that said, either you deny Jesus and quit preaching about Jesus or we're going to kill you. And every one of them chose death. John was the only one who died a natural death and he spent time on the Isle of Patmos because of his faith. Exiled. Cut off. These men changed the world because of their determination in essence, they said, we will do whatever it takes to follow you. Third response I call deterioration. I stole that from William Barclay's commentary. And Judas is the example. I want you to go back to the American Revolution with me. Anybody remember the name Benedict Arnold? Benedict Arnold was a brigadier general in the colonial army. And he joined the colonial army to fight for freedom, and he was committed to that. But then, if you read the history, over time he became disillusioned. He became disappointed because he wasn't getting the recognition that he thought he deserved. And so he began to, to lose passion and vision for what he had joined up with. And then he became... Uh, involved with a woman whose father was a British loyalist. And that woman got him in touch with a British spy by the name of John, John Andre. I think his last name was Andre. And with time, he began to compromise his commitment. But instead of walking away and joining the British, he stayed in the colonial uniform. He was given charge of West Point, the fort at West Point, and... Benedict Arnold intentionally weakened the defenses of West Point and surrendered it to the British. Now, of course, when the colonists found out about that, they wanted to hang him. He managed to evade that. And he eventually did join the British Army as a brigadier general and fought with them. But if you think of a name in American history that talks about somebody who betrays someone, Benedict Arnold's name is it. John 6 brings us face to face with the name that Scripture attaches once someone who's, who betrays. Judas. Judas Iscariot. It's interesting that the text does say Jesus knew 
who would who believed and who did not. Let me think about that. Can, can you wrap your head around a couple lessons from that? Number one, Jesus knows who believes. I'm not the one to make that judgment about one standing with God. I cannot sit here and look at you and say, no, you're not following Jesus, or you are following Jesus. I can't look inside. Jesus knows that. I told the first service, that's above my pay grade, way above my pay grade. But the second thing that truth teaches me is that it is absolutely possible to deceive others as well as myself about my standing with God. I can lie to myself and make myself believe I'm all right when in reality, the opposite is true. Jesus is the only one who knows. We need to constantly come to Him and ask the Spirit to examine us and reveal to us the truth about who we are and where we stand. But let's get back to Judas for a moment. Judas Iscariot, he is the only non-Galilean apostle. Every one of the others, all 11 others are from Galilee. Judas is from Judea. Now, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what he chose to do, but he was the outsider in the group. He was the only non-Galilean. I want to I want to emphasize this point. We often hear people say, well, Judas was picked because he was going to betray Jesus. I do not believe that's true. I, be- I absolutely believe Judas had a choice. That he, somewhere along the line, we're going to talk about that, made the choice to abandon Jesus because he began his walk with Jesus with sincere devotion. I believe Judas caught the vision of what Jesus was all about and Jesus called him to be one of the twelve. And Jesus may not have been surprised by Judas' betrayal, but he did not set him up to fail. He was not... That violates everything in my mind that I know about God and His fairness and His His righteous judgment. But somewhere along the line, in that faithful walk, Judas' faith and commitment began to deteriorate. What was it? I don't know. I have a hunch that like the first crowd, he began seeing that Jesus was going somewhere other than he thought he was going to go. It may have been Judas had images of an earthly kingdom, Jesus reigning in power, and anticipated that, and suddenly it began to dawn on him that that isn't what Jesus has in mind at all. And some have suggested because he wanted an earthly king, he betrayed Jesus to make Jesus take that step. But whatever it is, his relationship with Jesus deteriorated. It can happen to us. We we can begin with absolute sincerity. We can we can begin with absolute commitment to Jesus. But over time, whether whatever happens, maybe it's the hardships that come in life. Maybe it's the difficulties. Maybe maybe it's we just don't we aren't getting what we want, and that faith begins to deteriorate. But instead of walking away, what did Judas do? Played the role. He stuck around. He wore the facade of a faithful and committed disciple. We would call him a hypocrite. Hypocrite is just a term from Greek theater that describes someone who plays a role. They held a mask up. And Judas did that. We don't know when all this happened in his mind and how it all played out. But at some point along the line, he got to the place where he was no longer committed, but he didn't walk away. He stayed in the group. And there's often no individual that can do more damage to the cause of Jesus than someone who just plays a role. Judas' walk had a price. What was Judas' price? You know it. 
30 pieces of silver. Folks, when our faith begins to deteriorate, when our commitment to Jesus begins to crumble away, our walk with Him will have a price. That price when it becomes too costly to stay. Maybe we'll betray Jesus for a relationship with another person. A date with a, someone we really want to go out with, even though they aren't, that calls for us to compromise our faith. Maybe the spouse we marry. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's doing something that compromises that faith in order to get a promotion or a position at work. Maybe it's to avoid any uncomfortable situations because of my faith. At some point along the line, if we have deteriorated faith, there is a cost that will cause us to step back and to betray our commitment to Him. This really is a line in the sand. Jesus drew the line in the sand, not, not by, physically, but by His words. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, believe in me, accept what I am going to do for you. That's the line. And that day, there were some who walked away, some who stayed, and some who just continued to play the game. Today, Jesus has drawn the line in the sand for us. Where will you stand? Everybody has to make that decision. Everybody has to to come to that line and they have to decide whether they're going to step across or step back. And maybe you're here today and have have never made Jesus Savior and and Lord of your life and you know Jesus and and you've heard His teaching and and you just haven't made that decision to step across the line and, and now... Your face, Jesus says it's either one way or the other. It's this line across this line or out turning back. And today you may be here facing that decision. Do I make Jesus Savior and Lord? Do I step across the line through repentance? Do I step across that line and confess Him as Savior and Lord? Do I step across that line and obey Him in baptism? Do I step across the line and give my life fully to Him? Maybe we're here today as those who have said we are, we, we've made the commitment. No matter what, thick or thin, no matter what comes, we are standing our ground. And folks, that's, really that is what I've been dealing with ever since I heard that statement on that video. Because the question is, are you willing to do whatever it takes to walk with Jesus? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to help Willamina find Jesus. And today, I think as a congregation and as individuals, we stand on that line and Jesus says, are you willing to do whatever it takes? We watched the video Thursday night with some of the leaders and, and, and I asked that question. It was one of the discussion questions. And one of them said, well, I don't know whatever is. Whatever is a blank. Whatever is... Whatever Jesus asks, whatever Jesus puts before you, are you willing to do it to help someone find Jesus? Because it's all about them. See, one of the biggest mistakes we make in church is we make it about us. I get concerned about having my seat. I get concerned about singing my music. I get concerned about having things done my way. And it's never about you. It's never about me. It's about being willing to do whatever Jesus asks of us to do. And maybe some of us today are looking at that and saying, am I willing to do whatever it takes? Maybe some are here, have walked with Jesus for a long time and realize yeah, my commitment's kind of deteriorating. Yeah, I, I say I love Him, but I'm not really living fully sold out to Him. 
the lines walk. Whether we see it, it's a line that's there every day of our life. What will you do with Jesus? We're going to take some time to gather at His table. And as we take those emblems today, would you, and this, this again is my own, I shared first services is my own imagination. I can picture in heaven God drawing a line and saying, I need someone to go. I need someone to go and offer themselves as a sacrifice for sin that men might have eternal life. And Jesus stepping over saying, I'm going. Think about what He was willing to do for you. So while you're taking those emblems, would you also ask the Spirit to open your eyes, to open your heart, and help you know where you are in regards to that line today? After the emblems are served, we're going to offer a time of response. And maybe today is the time for someone to step across the line, whatever that decision may be. Father, thank You. Thank You for Jesus. Thank You for the fact that He was doing, willing to do whatever it took to bring us into relationship with You. Father, help us to listen and to hear Your Spirit speak to us in this quiet time. Thank You in Jesus' name. Amen.